Okay, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm gonna call this meeting to order. Today is Tuesday, April the 23rd, 2024. We're in the central jury room of the Ralph H. Walton Jr. Justice Center at 1200 West Pearl Street in Granbury, Texas. We're very pleased and honored today to have with us Pastor Marie Cardin with Brazos Covenant Ministries here today to do the invocation. I'm going to invoke the presence of Jesus. Thank you. Praying out of John 1. In the beginning was Jesus as the Word. He was with God and he was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things are made through him and without him nothing is made that has been made. In him was life and the light and the life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness, but the darkness cannot overcome it. So, Father, today, Jesus, we ask you to bless Hood County. Bless Judge Massengill and these commissioners. Thank you for their service. And, Lord, what I pray today is that we invite you in as our life and our light. Let light come in all that we do that Hood County would be pleasing to you. And Father, we say that no darkness can overcome your presence. And Father, that all that needs to be exposed is exposed and all that needs to come forward for our benefit and our blessing will come forward. Now, Lord, we thank you. Uh, you're here. Be our guide and be with us in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. Today we have some proclamations that we need to do, and the first one is a proclamation declaring May 12th to, to May 18th, 2024, it's National Police Week. And where is this right here? The sheriff is, is, is any other officers here? Well. I guess, yeah, all, all the law enforcement officers, would y'all please stand, the sheriff and constables and JPs and everybody there. Thank you. Many have gone beyond the call of duty 
and we have a community where these faithful have rendered dedicated service and in doing so have established for themselves an enviable and enduring reputation for preserving the rights and securities for each of us. Now therefore, the Hood County Commissioner's Court does hereby proclaim May 12 through 18, 2024 as National Police Week and May 11, 2024 as a day in which our community will join hands with others to say thank you to our local servants from the sheriff, constables, police, VRA, state troopers, and EMS branches. Signed this 23rd day of April, 2024, and all members of the Commissioner's Court have signed this beautiful proclamation. So, I would like to hand this to who is it? We have here, here, Laura Fisher and Margaret Cook and, and Kevin, Kevin Stark. And Faye look, at and yeah. look at that. It's a very beautiful deal. Y'all want to? You want to? Yes. Yeah. I mean, we move this, Judge. There you go. There we go. Hate to. I'll let the commissioner do it. Let me go this way. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. National Day of Prayer. I guess you wanted to read this. All right. <laughs> All right. This is a long one. So bear with me here. Okay. Whereas throughout history, America has faced trials and triumphs, and Americans have responded in prayer, seeking courage and comfort, inspiration, and joy filled celebration. Faith compels us to seek and cling to the light in times of darkness and spread light to those in need. And whereas from the first gatherings of our founding fathers, elected officials have prayed and entreated those they serve and represent to join them in prayer, including the authors of our Declaration of Independence, wrote that they, the representatives of the United States of America, in general Congress, assembled, appealing to the supreme judge of the world, and carried on to present day in presidential proclamations, such as last year's invitation to join him in asking for God's continued guidance, mercy, and protection. And whereas a national day of prayer has not only been a part of our heritage since it was declared by the First Continental Congress in 1775, but it is a public law established in the United States Congress in 1952, approved by a joint resolution and amended by Congress and President Reagan with Public Law 100-307 in 1988, affirming that it is essential for us as a nation to pray and direct the President of the United States to set aside and proclaim the first Thursday of May annually as the National Day of Prayer. And whereas in every state across America, the observance of the National Day of Prayer will be held on Thursday, May 2nd, 2024, with the theme, Lift Up the Word, Light Up the World, based on the verses found in 2 Samuel 22, 29 through 31, For you are my lamp, O Lord, and my God lightens my darkness. This God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord proves true. He is shield for all those who take refuge in him. And whereas unified prayer is mobilized across America every first Thursday of May on the National Day of Prayer, as neighbors come together to join their hearts and voices in reading sacred scriptures and attending services to seek God for the city and county where we live, learn, work, worship, serve, and desire all to thrive. And 
Whereas we express our faith and exercise our freedom in prayer, then unite our hearts and voices in personal prayer and public gatherings across America with fervent praise, repentance, love, and humble intercession for our neighbor and nation. Holding fast to the promises throughout the Holy Scripture that the Lord hears and avails much as he answers the faith-filled prayers of his people. Now, therefore, the Hood County Commissioner's Court does hereby proclaim May 2nd, 2024 as a National Day of Prayer. Signed this 23rd day of April, 2024, signed by all the commissioners and the county clerk and the judge. So, Miss Biggers. So. And Mary Yeah, that's the Hood County Prayer Task Force there. So, I guess we'll come up here and do some pictures. Thank you very much. Okay, um, next we have some service awards. This is coming kind of to be some shockers here. The first one is Terry Davis for five years. Ms. Is Terry Davis here? You get a new car too if you work in, if you're working for Judge Haddock's here, you get a award and a new car. For putting up the, just, <laughs> <laughs> Folks, this is Terry Davis. She is the latest addition to our office, the best office in Pitt County. We're keep keeping it that way. And we're really, really proud to have her on our staff. She's a blessing to us. She's a blessing to the people of this county. Congratulations, Terry. Bye -bye. Okay. sheet of paper and the county's too cheap to buy your frame so I'll buy you one. There you go. <laughs> Next is Marissa Rebeloso. Is she, she is unable to attend this morning. Okay, she's working. Yes. 20 years. Yes. Yep, 20 years. Let's give her a hand. Thank you. <laughs> now, everybody's going to be shocked at this next one here. I know I am up here. Steve Sigler. Only 40 years. 40 years. This is as much hers as it is anybody's. Well, she deserves the Medal of Valor here. We got, yeah. Okay. Really? Uh, Lieutenant Siegler started out as a patrol guy, worked his way up to field training officer. He was, an F er, he was a chief deputy. He takes, he's done everything in the sheriff's office and everything he does, he is very, very good at and make sure it's done perfect. I sure am proud to have him. So thank you. Thank you, Sheriff. Okay. okay. Thank you thank for you. allowing him to be here with us. Oh, yeah. Thank you for coming. Okay, the next part of the agenda is the citizens' comments at large. And like I say every, every meeting, you must fill out a public participation form if you want to speak. And I have three thus far. 
So you need to fill one out. And if you want to fill one out for any agenda item, you must also fill out a public participation form. And I only have one. So you got another one, Chair? Okay. So the first person that's, thank you, Steve. Yes, sir. Keep up the good work. Yes, sir. <laughs> All right. Is Mr. Jim Bell. Mr. Bell? Is this working? Good morning. Okay. My name is Jim Bell. I am not here to advocate for or against the school bond currently under election, but I do work at the school bus yard for GISD, so I thought I would present a few facts for voters to consider. I drive a route and I am also the camera radio technician for GISD, a position which requires me to work hand in hand with the mechanics at the yard. GISD has a four bay shop. There are two full-time mechanics, a lube tech, and a shop manager. The shop manager is not always available to do mechanics tasks. At the beginning of the summer last year, 2023, the shop had over 200 work orders for school bus repair. They made some good progress addressing them during the summer. Once the school year began, we had at least one breakdown every school day during the first semester this year. On many days, there were more. During the second semester, we had at least one breakdown every single week. Many weeks, there were more. When there are breakdowns, the shop must focus on the breakdowns instead of the work order list. We have 54 route buses and 12 sub buses. The mechanics are working two shifts just to keep the buses running. The buses are safe, but they are worn out. My bus is 18 years old and it will have over 300,000 miles on it before the end of the day Thursday. It has been retired twice and recommissioned and placed back into service as a route bus. The heater of my bus went out last March and was not fixed until February this year. The air conditioner went out last April and it still has not been fixed. Some of the windows have bent tracks and cannot be opened or closed easily. Many of the seats are tattered and the flooring is beginning to come up. Until two weeks ago, only one of my eight dash gauges had a working light. Some of the breakdowns on my bus this year include the steering linkage, which took the bus out of service until it was fixed, a door fell off, which also took the bus out of service until it was fixed, and once the bus, full of students in 100 degree heat, just died on Apache Circle in Indian Harbor. That required a tow truck and a ride back to the yard. The students scrambled off the bus and went to their homes. Yet another bus in our fleet had a door fall off the bus this year and that door hit a student. Most of our route buses have over 270,000 miles on them. 80% of the route buses we have have no working air conditioning. This year, two bus drivers suffered from heat exhaustion. GISD's last school built was Mambrino in 1966, uh, 1996. Although property appraisals have increased within the district, the increased funding to GISD's general fund because of the property values largely goes back to the state. That's because when local tax revenues increase, the state decreases the amount of school funding it sends to district, canceling the gains. The state has set the basic allotment for ISDs at $6,160 per student per year. Special ed students get a little bit more, but the basic allotment remains at $6,160 per student per year. It has not changed since its establishment, and there has been a 14.5% inflation rate since then. All money over the basic allotment is recaptured by the TEA and then redistributed to the smaller ISDs. I have interviewed the GISD superintendent, Dr. Glenn, and the CFO, Emmett Whitefield, about the bond. And I have found that maintenance and operation portion of the budget that comes from taxes are recapturable funds. They do not escape recapture. Last year, $10,485,110 was recaptured by the state. 
since the school year of 2007-2008, GISD has paid $99,141,696 in recapture payments. Bond dollars for capital projects and purchases stay local and are not subject to recapture. Those dollars will go directly to the projects outlined. The buildings, schools, maintenance facilities, and things like that will be put on a 30-year bond. Buses and technology on a 10-year. All school bond ballots are required to include the phrase, this is a property tax increase. And although the bond authorizes a tax increase, it does not automatically implement one. GISD can make all existing and new bond payments without raising the current tax rate. Since the projects in the bonds can be completed without a tax increase, taxpayers will be helping GISD pay off the bond for a longer period. But this tax increase is not foreseeable in the immediate future. More information about the bond is provided at granburyisd.org. Click on the bond 2024 tab. Thank you, sir. Okay. Okay. All right. Next is uh, Mr. Harold Granick. Dr. Granick. Thank you, commissioners and judge, uh, uh, to support the uh, speaker just before me. The students are the greatest asset in Hood County, and they're our future. We should support the bond issue. Okay. Next, Steve Biggers. Good morning, court. It's a rare day that you get both Biggerses in the house. So, uh, my wife and I at our property, we uh, we have a saying when you come in our property from a Bible verse. It's Joshua 24:15. As far as me and my household, we're going to follow God. And we do that to the best of our abilities. We seek his face. I know I do and I know my wife does daily. To, to seek his direction as a believer in Jesus and to stand firm. So let's talk about the incident on Friday. And, and sometimes you feel like God's not there and then sometimes God just comes up and smacks you right in the face. So everybody knows I got arrested on Friday and everybody knows I went to jail. Before I left the house, I very rarely request something for supper. And I told my wife I'd be back at 6.30. And I said, hey, I'm, I'm hungry for macaroni, cheese, and fish. And she said, okay, fine. So 20 minutes later, I'm on the side of the road and I'm going to the jail and getting processed, having to take off my yellow bond shirt for my mug shot, belt, shoes, all that stuff. And they tell me I'm gonna be out in the morning, processed in the morning. And there's your dinner over there, and we're going to put you in a holding cell. Well, guess what I had for dinner in the jailhouse on Friday night? Macaroni, cheese, and fish. I had requested that 30 minutes earlier from my wife. And I'm saying, okay, God, you got me here for a reason. I don't know what it is, but I'm here. <laughs> so then they put me in the jail holding room, and I'm with a 19-year-old kid that's about ready to go into general population, and he's scared to death. And I'm talking to him about, God, don't fear. No clue, deer in the headlights look. So long and short, I led that young man to Jesus in 20 minutes and his life has changed. He, he went from death to life. And then I was drug out for a detective interview for a temporary tag citation. And I came back and, and Lewis was gone. He was in general population. So again, God, this is why you had me here. I'm good with this, I'm okay. So. It's really clear in the Bible when you hear and you read what man me means for evil, God turns to glory and good. And Sheriff Deeds, this was evil. You meant this for evil. And your law enforcement people that helped with this meant this for evil. And God turned it to good because a young man's eternity has changed, absolutely changed. So let's recap the last two years. The last two years of me sitting in this free job the county judge throws me out of court for my free speech rights, and the conservative Fifth Circuit is about ready to rule on that. And then I get the county attorney file a lawsuit against me because of my sovereign property rights. And I lost that battle, but we won the war when Ms. Samuelson sat in that seat, and the sovereign property rights are now here for people that own property. Now I have the county sheriff coming after me, and I get arrested for a felony for a temporary tag. 
And yesterday, the elected county treasurer's office refused to issue a DMV temporary tag. That's four elected officials that have come after me for this free job, this free job. So tax, tax I, assessor's I, office, sorry. I'd, say again? Not, not treasurer or tax assessor. No, tax assessor. Yeah. I'm skewed. Sorry. sorry. I'm really sorry. <laughs> <laughs> tax <laughs> assessor. I'm sorry. Who conveniently wasn't there. She just let her clerks take the brunt of everything. So I'm not mad because I'm in God's will. I'm absolutely where God wants me. And I will stand in this place and I will continue to push back because God goes before me. And, and it's very clear in there, woe is to the person that wants to push back against God. I put on my armor every day and I continue to fight this battle and will continue to fight this battle. Not even when I'm out of the chair. I was an activist prior to this and I will be an activist after this because this is wrong. This elitist, established mindset that goes on in this county has to stop. There are citizens that come into this county that have a voice and have a right. So what I encourage everybody to do, May 2nd, show up and pray and pray and pray for Hood County. We need this county to come together and pray. But as far as me and my household, I will stand on the word of God. Okay, Mike Lowry. Yes. Court, judge, uh, I wasn't going to speak today. I just came to kind of watch, but my heart is deeply saddened. And honestly, my brain is just uh, trying to comprehend what's going on in our community. Um, I'm afraid to speak, but I mustered the courage to do so because I felt that it was important. Because honestly, I don't want to put a target on our back any more than it's already done. My wife, as many of you know, is a board trustee and constantly is getting um, ridiculed, lambasted on email. Um, it's really unbelievable how much we've experienced in this community the hate towards her because she simply stands up for what she believes is, tr is right and true. But what I've observed recently, I think everybody in this room will admit, this community is deeply divided at the dangers and peril of ourselves and our future generations. I spent 35 years in law enforcement. I've taken away the freedoms of individuals temporarily for long term, I put people, my cases have put people in prison. And to see our community go in this direction, it disturbs me. Whether you like an individual, don't like an individual, don't like an individual for what they stand for or not, should never, never play in our judgment as law enforcement and authorities. This court, the courts, the judges, law enforcement officers should never allow a personal opinion to play into their decision-making authority. It's a tremendous responsibility. It's a tremendous authority that an individual has to take the freedoms away from a person, even temporarily, to put handcuffs on somebody, to reduce their ability to talk to people, to call people, to walk freely in our communities. And what I witnessed this past week, I can't speak on the facts. I don't know them any better than any of you know them. But to see what happened in our community over the last few months and what happened last week, no one was in harm's way. Nobody's life was in peril. There was no fear of flight. It clearly sent a very deep political message in our community. And that's disturbing to me. I've been a supporter of law enforcement. I'm the first to stand on the center of the stage and on the steps of our courthouses and sing the praises of law enforcement because I know what they go through each and every day. I know the dangers they face each and every day. And for whatever reason, 
the urgency of this particular incident required some, an individual to put somebody on the street to take their freedoms away for just a few hours for what I can see as a process violation, an ordinance violation, is just astonishing to me. Judge, commissioners, we look to you as leaders in our community. We look to you to set an example in our community. We need healing in our community. The vision in this community is overwhelming to me. As leaders of our community, step into that gauntlet. Put a pause on what's going on. Stop this nonsense that's going on in our community. You can have an impact. You can have an impact in our community and we need healing. I can't speak on the facts of that case. I just know from my 35 years of experience of charging an individual with a felony crime and take their freedoms away from him, potential long-term freedoms away from him, has to be a serious decision made. We in law enforcement have discretion. One of the first things I learned as a rookie police officer in St. Louis, you have discretion. Not everybody needs to go to jail. But we have to heal. There's no healing going on. And I look to this court and I look to other leaders in our community to lead us into that healing. We gotta stop this nonsense, ladies and gentlemen. This community is too important. Thank you for your time. Mike McMahon. <clears throat> I'm coming before you as chaplain of the county commissioner's court. <laughs> Thank you. I, just, from, just from this morning, I have been impressed by the Lord to speak of the Bible reading marathon that is coming up. It's absolutely imperative that we have enough people to read through the Bible. There is nothing that can replace reading through the Bible. Did you all know that the crime rate drops in Hood County for that week? Did you know that people have been saved simply by reading their Bible up there? Did you know that husbands who have brought their wives up there to read and you invite them to read and they say, I, I don't do that, I can't do that, have left with tears in their eyes after they read and asking if they could come back and read again? Did you know that we had a man who, he was a Navy SEAL. He was listening to one of the ladies read in the Bible and forgive me for my language, but it's just what he said. Lady, you're scaring the hell out of me. And he said that about four times. And she was so involved in her reading, she didn't understand or hear, I guess. I finally got up and I went over and I said, sir, please. He said, you don't understand. I've been all around the world. I've murdered people in the name of my country. He said, and she's scaring me to death. And I said, let's go down and we'll talk. So we went down to talk. I told him, I said, man, I can't do anything now, but if you see me on Monday morning, we'll get together. He did agree to that. On Monday morning, I got a call from his wife and he had dropped dead Sunday night and he never got there. But I want you to know that the Bible reading marathon made a difference in that man's life. It made differences in kids. Have you, how many of you think you could handle it when a little kid, two years old, three years old, and the mom or the daddy are up there holding them like this with the Bible open, and the mom reads, and the Lord said, and the little baby goes, 
and the little horse head. It'll tear your heart out. So if there's any reason that you cannot sign up and read at the Bible mar reading marathon, <laughs> don't tell me because I'm going to chew your ears off. You have no excuse. None of us in this room has an excuse for not signing up and reading from Scripture. We have an, uh, an expression I've heard a little bit of. If somebody says it's good for hood. Well, I want to tell you, this is superb, supernatural, dynamic, and absolutely necessary for Hood County if we're going to continue as a group in unity, in harmony. <clears throat> Thank you, Lord. Thank you, men. And Thank you, chaplain. <laughs> okay, that concludes the open mic. And now we go into the miscellaneous business to be discussed and considered. And we're going to take something out of order here so that Miss Stephanie Cooper can go back to work and handle the election. So we're going to skip to number uh, eight. eight which is discuss and take appropriate action to direct the treasurer to use up to $3,000 within the election administrator's budget to pay 80 hours of comp time and direct the county auditor to make the associated line item transfer within the election administrator's budget. Ms. Cooper, you want to say anything about that? I know that you've probably talked to all of us and um, You've talked to the auditor and talked to all the commissioners, haven't you? And uh, yeah, I've talked to most of you, yes. You know, you put a lot of hours in every time you have an election and you're coming up again and it's a big one. You've got a lot of good runoffs and you're in the middle of one right now, haven't you? And you yeah. accumulate a lot of comp hours. I think, for one, I think that you're doing a fabulous job. You came in here when everything I can see Greg Harrell shaking his head in agreement with that, and I agree with that. You came here and, and the elections office was, it was really an awry, and you've really done a great job, and you do a great job. You're fair, you're impartial, you've got some good employees and some good volunteers, and you do a great job. Let's give her a hand. I mean, that's too. Okay. So, I think that this transfer with your accumulation of comp hours on the thing, this is your plan of reducing the comp hours, isn't it? Right, and then over, of course not May, because I have the two elections, but over the course of the summer between now and, or at the end of May and then um, the beginning of the new fiscal year, I plan to be taking some time off, getting rid of the rest of it, so okay. it'll go away. Well, I've read the stuff and I know I'm in favor of it. Does any commissioner wish to say anything? If not, do I hear a motion? Yes, I'll make a motion to um, take appropriate action to direct the treasurer to use up to $3,000 within the election administrator's budget to pay 80 hours of comp time and direct the county auditor to make the associated line item transfer within the election administrator's budget. Second. Okay. Commissioner Samuelson has made a motion to direct the treasurer to use up to $3,000 within the election administrator's budget to pay eight hours of comp time and direct the county auditor to make the uh, associate line item transfer within the election administrator's budget, second by Commissioner Andrews. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. Motion carries unanimous. Thank you. Now go back and Thank do you, a good sir. job out there. All right, good luck. Thank you. Okay, the next item. Consider and take appropriate action to enter into a memorandum of understanding and allow the county judge to sign this memorandum of understanding with both Erath County and Somerville County. Sheriff Deeds. Judge, commissioners, this is extending part of the, the radio system that we have in place. We build a tower up on the Diamond A Ranch and Erath County would like to have access to put um, equipment up there and that'll just enhance our radio system to the west like that, so I'm all for it. And then the other part was Somerville County, it's actually their tower on their property at, at Chalk Mountain, so what we have up there is just our equipment, but that would allow 
them to interface with our equipment to their to expand that part of the system too so we'd be expanding farther to the south and farther to the southwest so this is going to enhance everything for hood county and our radio system so um, i'd ask that you um, allow the judge to sign these two memorandum of understandings okay yeah, I'm, I'm really glad that uh, ERATH and Somerville are coming on board with this, and this really complements our system and expands that range and brings yep, that's good. Uh, uh, communication. It. Yep, this is a good thing. Good, if very I'm good thing. Thinking this will help reduce the areas that have zero, you know, radio capabilities at this time, also because there's still little pockets that are out there where there's no communication. Years past the. Uh, get off to the west side of the county and there's a lot of holes but yeah this is definitely going to make it make it better or should fix everything actually so right very good thing yeah it's all about communication okay great do i hear a motion yeah judge i'll make a motion to uh, approve the entering the into a memorandum of understanding and allowing the county, county judge to sign the mous with erath in somerville county second yeah, both been made by Commissioner Andrews to take the appropriate action to allow the county judge to enter into a memorandum of understanding and to sign the memorandum with Erath County and Somerville County, second by Commissioner Wilson. Any further discussion? Just got one comment, uh, <clears throat> and I'm, this is not a criticism, but it'd be—I didn't know what this was about, so I would at request that. You know, you put regarding cell towers or something so the people out here would know what we're doing. But beyond that, sorry. It's the only comment. Well, I knew I was going to be here to talk about it, but yeah, I should have put more to it so everybody could understand that. So, okay, that's it. Just a comment. Okay. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. Motion carries unanimously. <clears throat> Fine, I'll sign the memorandum, Sheriff. Thank you. Okay. Item number two, consider and take appropriate action to award RFP 2024-01 Fire Extinguisher and Suppression Services Maintenance and Purchasing here. Yes, Good morning, sir. Judge Commissioners. Uh, so the bids for the Fire Extinguisher and Suppression Services uh, RFP 2024-01 were opened April 2nd at 10 a.m. After examining the two qualified responses, it's the recommendation of purchasing and facility maintenance to award the contract to access fire and safety. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions or comment? If not, do I hear a motion? Yeah, I make a motion to award RFP 2024-01 fire and extinguisher, or fire extinguisher and suppression services to access fire and safety. Second. You say Atlas or Axis? Axis. Axis. Okay, thank you. A yeah, motion has been made by Commissioner <coughs> Andrews to award RFP 2024-01 Fire Extinguisher and Suppression Service to Axis. Is that correct? Yes, Axis. Second by Commissioner Samuelson. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you, Glenn. Thank you. Okay, item number three, discuss and take appropriate action to accept the refund check for credit memos from Benny Keith funds to be added to the following accounts. Okay, um, we got Stephanie Matlock up here. So we got some credit memos and some grocery memos. And as I understand it, this is just a House cleanup people, yeah. of the book records. And we got some additional monies and we got to write a check. So the budget. Am I right on this? You're correct. Um, okay. This is just a housekeeping item. Um, some of these credit memos for, were from prior year, so we'll have to accept those into miscellaneous revenue. And then the current year stuff will just go back in that expense line and wash itself out. Okay. So you, all the books are straight, and what you're <coughs> doing is just appropriate within gap principles here. Correct. Yeah, we're certifying additional revenue that we were not expecting. Okay. Any other comments or questions? If not, do I hear a motion? Yes, I move that we accept the refund check for credit memos from Benny Keith funds to be added to the following accounts. Miscellaneous revenue in the amount of 3536.07 and groceries to 1748.19. Okay, motion been made by, is it out here a second? 
Second. Postman made by Commissioner Wilson to accept the refund check for credit minimals from Benny e. Key to be added to the following accounts, $3,536.07 and groceries of $1,748.19 to those various accounts. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. Motion carries <coughs> unanimously. Then we got an outstanding invoice of $686. Is that included in that too? So that will be. That's just operational stuff. So that's just operational stuff. So yeah. Is that included? Do we need to make a separate motion on that or? No, it's Is all it all included? Yes, sir. The okay. normal payment. Yes. Okay, good deal. Thank you very much. That good. Okay, item number four, discuss, draft, of Hood County fund balance policy. This is a discussion item only. No action will be taken. All right, thank you, Judge. So a few months ago, I provided a couple of fund balance policy examples from other counties for the court to review. And additionally, when uh, those who are here in the court will remember that when Mr. Sub Sabonis, our investment advisor was here, he recommended that we adopt a fund balance policy um, as he stated, it was his observation that all well-run counties um, have a fund balance policy in place. At that time, though, our new auditor, Ms. Matlock, was pretty new. She had just arrived on the job, and um, the court felt that it was appropriate to give her several months to kind of get her feet on the ground and, and understand fund accounting. So fortunately, Ms. Matlock is a very quick study. <laughs> She's... Um, doing a fantastic job as our county auditor. And uh, today um, is discussion only, and I provided a draft which was, I took several of the ideas from a couple of the other counties and, um, and created this one for Hood County. Again, it's draft. I expect there to be quite a few updates from the court or the auditor or maybe even from our investment advisor, Mr. Sabonis. But it's a start, and so I'd like to go over some of the key areas of the policy, and I also, oh, I already said that I've sent it to Mr. Sabonis, so I asked Drew to kind of follow along. I'm just going to read a few of the things. Um, so in uh, fund accounting, we go by what's called GASB, Governmental Accounting Standards Board. So in the second paragraph, it kind of describes what this is, what GASB 54 requires local governments to focus on the constraints imposed upon resources when reporting fund balance in government funds. The fund balance classifications indicate the level of constraints placed upon how resources can be spent and identified and identify the resources of these constraints. Sorry, identify the sources of these constraints. The five constraints serve to inform readers of the financial statement of the extent to which the county is bound to honor constraints on the specific purpose for which resources can be spent. So if you skip down to objectives, it says um, on the annual budget, so in preparation and in deliberations on the annual budget to ensure that sufficient resources are maintained for unanticipated expenditures, revenue shortfalls, and to preserve the flexibility throughout the fiscal year to adjust funding for programs approved in connection with the annual budget. So I skip down to purpose, and this is available you know, on our, if you go to the agenda and click on the links, you can download this and read it, the entire thing. Um, just in, kind of in the middle of the paragraph, through the maintenance of adequate levels of fund balance, the county can stabilize funding for operations, stabilize taxes, and realize cost savings in issuing debt. Then in the last sentence on that page, as part of this plan, the county recognizes the significance of maintaining an appropriate level of fund balance as one component of sound financial management and therefore formally establishes this policy for the county's fund balance. And then within the scope, just so um, we all understand that we have the general fund, we also have the road fund, road, and we have the library fund. So this policy will en encompass those three funds. 
the authority of the of the fund is the Hood County Commissioner's Court. And as it says, responsibility of the county auditor shall be responsible for the implementation of and administration of the policy. So then it goes through the components of fund balance and it talks about non-spendable fund balance, restricted fund balance, which is on the next page. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, committed fund balance. So what that is, um, Fund balance reported as committed includes amounts that can be used only for specific purposes determined by a formal action of the Hood County's Commissioner's Court. And then there's some examples there. Assigned fund balance, assigned fund balance report, fund balance reported as assigned represents a, amount intended to be used for specific purposes, but not meeting the criteria as committed. The intent is expressed by the commissioner's court and implemented by the county auditor. And then there's some examples there. So after that, everything else falls into unassigned. Unassigned fund balance, if it's reported as unassigned, represents the residual classification of fund balance and includes all spendable amounts not contained in the other above classifications. So skipping down to policy general fund, about in the middle of the paragraph, the county decide, desires, and this is um, again a draft, I expect there to be changes, but this is a place to start. The county desires to maintain stabilization funds in the unassigned fund balance of up to four months of regular general fund operating expenditures or about 35% based on the most recently completed fiscal year. Now we heard from Mr. Sabonis that four to six months, I think I've talked to Stephanie, she just um, coincidentally went to a, a really good class last week and she heard a lot about fund balance and asked a lot of questions. So um, she's got, I'm sure, some input on that. Skipping down to the second to last paragraph, at the completion of any fiscal year, if the unassigned fund balance falls below the goal established by the fund balance policy, the commissioner's court will establish budget strategies and time frames necessary to return to its goal. Examples would be to reduce re recurring expenditures, increase revenues, pursue other funding sources, or enact some combination of these measures. When unassigned fund balance exceeds the established goal, it may be designated as committed or assigned per the actions outlined in this policy or utilized for one-time non-recurring expenditures such as purchase of capital assets. However, it cannot be, it cannot justify increasing overhead levels of future maintenance and operations costs. So skipping to the next page on the road and bridge fund, just point out that it is currently the draft has minimum of three months or 25% and the library is the same, three months, 25%. And then at the bottom, for us to be able to watch this on a continual basis to ensure that we are appropriately managing it, <coughs> um, the county auditor will provide the balance sheet report for each of the co county funds in the financial report at each, for each commissioner's court. So just another, um, document, our county auditor already provides many reports for us to review for every commissioner's court and this would just be another sheet to go so that we could ensure that we are watching this balance. So open for discussion, that's all I had. Okay, anybody else have anything? Any yeah, speakers? I do. Are there any speakers? We do have a speaker, Tina Brown. Okay, she yields the floor. Please go to comment. She said she can, speak. she can come yeah. up and speak. Go ahead. I appreciate hearing what Mr. Eagle has to say before I speak. Can I do that? Uh, I'd rather you go ahead and speak. <laughs> well, most of my questions were answered. Um, you said Sabonis um, suggested four to six months on all these different? I think mainly he was talking about the general fund because that's the major fund, but 
I'm okay. So I did. I I've been real busy, but I did do a, a little search, and it's like, is there a law? Or is this just recommendations? And what is normal across the state of Texas? Does anybody have? I think that'd be a great question for Ms. Matlock since she just got back from her. Oh, um, yeah. Um, so I just went to an auditor's conference and I actually was in a forum, a question and answer forum, and I pulled all the other counties that were equivalent to our size within a range. And there was a multitude of responses. So some follow the GASB rule of three months, others extend it out a little bit further. I think it's discretionary dependent on how you run. Um, I prefer a conservative closer to six months number. Um, but that's just what the other counties, it was, it was definitely a, like a <laughs> wide variety there. Okay, all right. I, I just, I couldn't find that. I, I looked to see if there was a law or a statute or anything like that, and, and I couldn't find one, so, yeah. I mean, how, I, I would classify this as a best practice. Okay. Um, and it, as Mr. Sabona said, he said most well-run counties adopt a fund balance policy. It, to me, it's just, it's a guiding principle of how you manage your budget, and it's a uh, you know, this is taxpayer money and we want to be sure that we're doing everything we can to have the, the best policies in place to make sure we're doing the right thing. And we've never had a policy on this before? We just... Not that I know of. Uh, it's always been six months, I think, under Becky, hadn't it? So I did find something from 2011 from Stan way before Becky, and it was when we were in a cash flow crisis. And so at that time, we did implement a six-month a five to six month reserve balance because we were having trouble. Um, it was a, a shrinking economy rather than what we're facing now is a growing economy. So it's kind of, it's a, it's a decision based on, you know, a conservative viewpoint and the ability to, to maintain our budget and be able to fund it fully, even if we don't receive all the anticipated revenues. So it's better to have more there, just like you run your own personal budget, you know. But as far as a, adopting a formal policy, um, I don't. I don't think that this county is a. a I mean, I, I haven't been here as long as the rest of the gentlemen on the court, or as long as many of the people employees. So um, I'm not. I haven't found where the county has adopted a formal policy in the past. Well, um, I'm. I'm happy to say that six months sounds good to me too. It's like, especially if we encounter another drop. So, uh, there was a to be very careful with. Yeah, we need to be careful about how large we make it, though. Yeah, but we also need to be careful about run out of money. Thank you. Okay. Anything else? Yeah, I've got something. Um, so this has been kind of an ongoing issue every year for me. And uh, as far as GASB 54, I researched this big time three or four years ago. And uh, I'm in total agreement with having a written policy on this. I think there's been disagreement. Uh, before we had five to eight months uh, in the unassigned. And I'm lean more towards three to four months. And that's that was a, as you have stated, a. It's a policy decision. Uh, I look at it this way. Every, every penny that's in that unassigned balance is to look at it in a, in a practical way is in, in a savings account. It's just it's money that we're taking from the taxpayers and it's sitting over in an account to be used if something comes up. It's unassigned. And so the question becomes, are you, do you want a six or seven months in a savings account of taxpayers' money, or do you want a little bit less? And of course, my I think Jim Sabonis talked about three to four. Uh, I've heard six to seven, uh, but it's just a policy where it, in my opinion, the lesser that we have in the fund balance, leaning towards the three to four month side, the more it puts us in a position to make sure we're staying within our budget and that we don't have this extra fluff. There's a, there's a continuum here. There's a story about Davy Crockett where he was talking to a man that was actually a very learned man in the government and his philosophy was 
the government should not have one more penny than it needs to operate from the taxpayer. And that's it. Now, it is prudent business to have some money in reserve in case the economy down, there is a downturn. And that, uh, but I don't know if we need six or seven months of operating expenses in a savings account. So I'm very happy that this that uh, Commissioner Samuelson has actually brought this to the table. I appreciate all Ms. Matlock's study on this. Uh, I think that it, this is a very good, prudent idea, and it also it gives the taxpayers out here one more uh, piece of information where they can see what we're doing, and I think that's very important. So. Um, the, the GASB is just a standard. It's like general accepted counting, accounting rules. Uh, it's just a, st a standard for which you can use as a guideline. And I appreciate this. This is a very, in my opinion, the way it's written and presented. It lays out the five categories of fund balance and uh, describes them, explains them, and defines them. And uh, so I'm, I, like, I like the Commissioner Samuelson's and uh, Ms. Matlock's work on this. Thank you. Okay. Anything else? Okay. I'll just just mention one thing. Just to there, so the unassigned fund balance is, as I mentioned earlier, is the the last category. And let's say, for example, that the commissioners decided to allocate some amount of funding. The commissioners' court decided to allocate some amount of funding for a capital project, whatever that may be. That would be outside of the whatever the currently it says 35 percent. That would be outside of that. This is the unassigned fund balance. So, if for example we got into a, a some kind of catastrophe, what it says here on the top of page um, five is the order of expenditure. The court would start with the most restricted category and spend those funds first, moving to the next category. So, if we had assigned some some amount of money to committed or assigned for projects that we anticipate coming up and ran into some sort of economic crisis, we would, we would in essence, cancel those capital projects, use those funds for the crisis, and then before we ever went into the unassigned category. So that's what um, that order of expenditure of funds states. So I'll, I'll um, go ahead and give several weeks. We don't have court again till the 14th of May. So that this is one of those times where we have five Tuesdays in April. So we have a little bit of extra time here to review this policy and I'll anticipate putting it back on the agenda. But definitely if you have changes or questions and you want um, to modify it, um, let me know. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, item number five. Discuss and take appropriate action to reclassify a position in the IT department from Tech One to Office Manager. Mr. Drew Whitaker. Thank you, Judge Commissioners. Um, five and six kind of go hand in hand with each other. <clears throat> As you are aware, I have a retirement in my department. Um, and with that, that position is classified a tech one, step one, and I would like to classify it as a more office manager position for clerical work. Um, and with that, it would, of course, bring the salary down to save the county some money. Bring the salary down? Yes, sir. Yeah. Paul is retiring? Yes, sir. No, sir. An office manager is what you need more right now. Yes. Than is that. Yes, sir. Okay. Well, I think you know more about what you're doing in your apartment than we do, so I'm in favor of it. Anybody have any questions or comments? Do I hear a motion? Yes. I move that we reclassify the, a position in the IT department from Tech 1 to Office Manager 1. Second. Okay, a motion made by Commissioner Wilson to reclassify a position in the IT department from Tech 1 to Office Manager, second by Commissioner Eagle. Any further discussion? If not, all those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say nay. Motion carries unanimously. All right, your second to go along with that is consider and take appropriate action to hire a new employee in information technology at Office Manager 1-1 
$40,000 annually, effective Monday, May 6, 2024. Yes, Judge Commissioners, um, with your approval, this will give me the ability to get with Melissa with HR and I can actually post the job okay. to start looking. Good, and that's less than a tech one. Then, yes, right? yes sir it is. Okay, so it's savings, okay, mm -hmm. good. Do I hear a motion? Again, I move that we allow information technology to hire a new employee at office manager 1-1 one, uh, one -1 at 40,000 annually, effective Monday, May 6, 2024. Second. A motion made by Commissioner Wilson to allow IT to hire a new employee as office manager 1-1 one, one at $40,000 annually, effective Monday, May 6, 2024, second by Commissioner Eagle. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say nay. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. You're on a roll, Drew. Okay. Item number seven, discuss and take appropriate action to institute fees for VIN verification inspections performed by the fire marshal and sheriff's office deputies prior to issuing initial title or title transfers. Tax assessor collector will collect fees prior to inspections being performed. Take appropriate action to assign an account for the collected funds. Okay, who wants to go first? All right. All right. <coughs> Judge, commissioners, uh, I've been doing VIN inspections for the county for probably seven years now. When I was with the sheriff's office, I did the auto theft and became an auto theft investigator. And I'm going to continue doing that. Uh, the reason for this is, is at the time, I talked to the sheriff and we asked about just doing it, we could charge $40 for these inspections. And he said, no, we'll just do it as a community service. Uh, right now we're probably averaging 300 a year. So, you know, if you, some, some years are less, some years are going to be more. Uh, but anyway, I mean, that's, there's $8,000 of revenue or things that we could maybe could use for training or something like that that, that uh, we were wanting to try to implement. Well, and one of the things is not every county has uh, this particular circumstance and a lot of other counties are sending people our way. So these are even a lot of folks that aren't in our county that are bringing these vehicles. And, and a lot of times this may be an out-of-state trailer where it's not required to be registered or whatever and then whenever they come here we've got to make sure that it's not a stolen vehicle you got to check the VIN run the VIN this stuff takes time and, and right. they're out here on Thursday Thursday mornings a lot of times spending quite a bit of time uh, making sure making sure these vehicles are titleable that there's not they're not stolen there's not uh, well, other the, issues yeah, going Texas on. DMV yeah. requires that out-of-state trailers and vehicles that come in that that aren't titled and stuff that they be uh, certified and make sure that they're not stolen so right so if you have something that's in good title or whatever just uh, person to person this this isn't something that everybody has to go through but it is a specific that ha uh, right. circumstance that uh, only those people that are using that particular thing have to have to pay for that and like I said it's a lot of times not not even people in our county I mean there's some days we come up there and, and nobody shows up and we may have 10 or 15 one day so it just it's it's spotty, yeah. But it's a, it's a service and it's things that, that that people need when they come move to Texas, or if you build a homemade trailer, you got to have it certified and stuff like that. So, yep. how much are the fees y'all plan on charging? For Forty. This? How much? Forty is what the state okay. allows. Are we going to put that in the motion here to do that? Yeah, and that's that tack. Uh, Andy that, said that they what, would. Um, Tarrant County charges. Yeah. And stuff. Okay. But right now, Tarrant County, the reason we have a lot coming in is because Tarrant County is booked two months in advance and they only do it once a month. Ah. So we do have a lot of people coming from Tarrant County and a lot of other counties to see our people in the back because they can get into them. So this is a very good idea. Right. And Long time coming. How would should how, have been brought earlier last year? <laughs> and how will you make this known to the public that this will now be a a well, charge? Usually, when the people come in to get their vehicles registered at the, at the tax assessor's office, when they go in, they'll have they'll tell them then that you're going to have to have a 68A for this vehicle, and they usually give them a form and it tells them all the things that they need. 
gives okay. them my phone number, Kevin's phone number for the sheriff's office, and they can call. And usually they want to make an appointment, but we just tell them to show up at nine o'clock. We get in line and we do them till we're done. We wait about 15, 20 minutes. If nobody shows up, then we we're done. Okay. Used to, used to I would go out, but it got so busy that you couldn't do your job. So finally, that's why we had to set up a specific day, mm -hmm. just set aside an hour or so to, to get them so done. So if there's people that are aware that in the past we haven't been charging and now it'll be $40, will there be something on our newsflash website or something that to let people? I don't know how that's going to work. I mean, I've had people come up that are so desperate to get it done, they want to offer me <laughs> money, and I, and I just tell them I, I can't take it, you know, okay. and, and that's not what I'm allowed to do. But uh, some I people mean, offer you $100 for it, you know. Yeah. <laughs> if, if you wanted to put something together and send it to the IT help desk to put on a news flash to let people know that, one, the service is available, and what day and how much it would be, that might be a, something that would help the public. But on the website, on the tax assessor's yeah. you know, page on the website, yeah, and then yeah. we all have of the that. the forms that we can update with the amount and everything, too, okay. to hand out to customers. Right, yeah. yeah, good. So okay. the next portion of this is where do those funds? Uh, TAC has said to just streamline everything and make it make sense. TAC will go ahead and collect those funds yeah, well, people, as people they come, come in to do morning, the inspections. They'll show up a little early, then go right. and pay their money. They'll give them a copy of a receipt, come out and show us to show that they've paid their $40 and then we will do their inspection for them. Right, so where do those, where do those funds go? We have, already have a collection fee account in the revenue for the, for tax, for tax assessor fees. Well, tax assessor well, says they don't want to have anything to do. Okay. Well, then might, yeah, we may just create a new, a new revenue account. account just for that to okay. maintain and, and watch it. Maybe its own budget, you know, revenue, and then maybe they can create a budget for what they want to spend it on also in this ne next budget cycle. Okay. And that so you're well, just going to create an account for it, the next budget It's cycle. a brand new, I think that would be the yeah. cleanest way of okay. handling it. The and they did the request, to, sorry. Oh, I was going to say, they did request that that's a rollover <laughs> account, if at all possible, to carry that balance from year to year. That way, if they uh, save it up a little bit and buy a bigger bigger item or bigger training or whatever well, it Kim is. Kim and I have been talking and she thinks, you know, we can, I have a form that when I started doing them, I, I have a form that holds three vehicles that we do and just keep track of them. But uh, maybe to use the money for some extra training or something that the officers need, you know, a lot of times you go through a budget year and some classes come up, sometimes we can't go to classes because we run out of money or whatever, you know, we could use something for that. Or equipment right. that we might need. So would that mean it would be a different fund um, to be able to roll it over rather than just a, an account in the revenue side? I think they have something like abandoned vehicles or something like that, a fund already set up that's rolling. Is that what it is, abandoned vehicles? Yeah, so we could just add it into that fund as own line mm -hmm. if you're okay with that. That's in the Sheriff's Department, I don't know. What about the department? We'll work together to make sure fire marshal needs anything. That yeah, we work. As long as it's separate, so we can show it. I think I fund 109 mm -hmm. is rollover account. So however it works, so we can utilize it however they need it. So the fire marshal does some, and then the sheriff's office does some. Yes. Okay. Yeah, we will. It would be a great idea to keep them in their own. Well, and that's. Because I had that form and I showed Kim, she said, well, we could do mark and fire marshal and sheriff's yeah. office and if we need something. A lot of times fire prevention stuff gets cut back and we need some equipment or things to give the kids for fire prevention week too we can ask to use. Okay. So it's up to y'all whether you want to keep it in that 109 or create its own fund for this specific issue and then separate them out. However, it's six one half dozen in the other. I mean, we can keep the 109 fund as far as I'm concerned. I can just make copies of my forms and give them to Kim, and that way she can have a record of, of, of how much that we've done through the fire marshal's office. It would be easy for me to do, to just add a fire revenue and a poops sheriff's office revenue and budgets to balance. Okay. So. Is this something that's going to be effective immediately or like a two-week notice after you get it posted on the 
web, on the website or you know, we get the verbiage in there where there, people can see that or you know, what's the plan? I, I would think that there would need to be some, a, a little bit of buffer in there because y'all have already handed out some forms or told people, hey, you need to come back next Tuesday. So I don't want well, to have told them come some back next that, Tuesday. You know, with not we're bucks. going to start charging. There's some people that yeah. build vehicles or they exchange them or they have whatever and they've come several times. So I've told a lot of them now that, you know, we're going to start charging. But And y'all do that on Thursdays? Yes, sir. So we could start charging May 2 or May 9. One of uh, those. I mean, I think we need to go ahead and get it on the website and let people make people aware, get the, the farms redone and get the account set up, you know, and, you know, and, you know, the second or the ninth would, you know, as a, an effective start date of when the fees are, are charged then. Yeah, and I think the ninth probably have a line from here to Fort Worth. People <laughs> wanting to get it done yeah. free. May 9th. You're going to get a lot of deals. I mean, you need to do it sooner than later. Well, when I, when I started doing, doing them here, the task force up there was real glad because they would have to try to send people down here and it takes away from their stuff up there because they're so busy. So, and they'll do, they'll do 100 that Thursday morning. That's Easy. what I'm saying. It'll be 100 that Thursday yeah. morning for sure. But we weren't even advertising that we did them before on, on, online or anything. But we can put some, we get something put up for, for that. Gonna make a so, motion? Yeah, and uh, what <laughs> do I just say? Uh, did I sign to account 109. Is that how? Okay. All right. Well, I make a motion that we institute fees for VIN uh, verification inspections performed by the fire marshals and sheriff's office deputies prior to issuing initial title or title transfer. Tax assessor will collect fees prior to inspections being performed and uh, sign those funds to 109. Second. Okay. Okay. All right, Commissioner Andrews have made a, a motion to um, like, uh, to institute fees for the VIN inspections performed by the fire marshal and sheriff's office deputies prior to in initiating initial title or title transfers. The tax collector assessor will collect fees prior to inspections being formed and assign these funds to what, 109? Is that right? Yes. And I think. I, I don't like the idea. I just think you need to put a mo motion out. Y'all going to do it? When's the next time you're going to do this on a Thursday? It'll be this Thursday. This Thursday? Nine o'clock. Yes, sir. Oh, yeah. I, okay, yeah. And I think May 9th is what, uh, to, to begin this at May 9th? I, 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 don't, I don't see that. You're going to have people coming down from Fort Worth and everybody else. There's going to be, like you said, 100 people wanting to get Well, I don't think we'll have that, no. It's, like I say, it's just very limited on what people do come here. Even if we put it out there and advertise it, I mean, I've got some people that send people to me from Comanche County and Brownwood because there's nobody in those areas. Okay, that well do give it. us a date. What's the date? May second, May ninth, what? May ninth is what? May ninth. We'll we'll start doing the May ninth. Okay. All right. Any further discussion? Second. Did you? It, a second by oh. Commissioner Wilson. Wilson. Okay. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say nay. Good. Motions unanimously. Go get them. All right. Thank Good you. Deal. All right. All right, we got number eight out of the way. So number nine, uh, discuss and take appropriate action to approve the following schedule for the placement and removal of flags along the sidewalk surrounding the historic courthouse. Mr. Phil Harris, you want to come up here and discuss that? I know that you have been working with Kathy Castro and a bunch of other people yes. getting this schedule. Am I correct, sir? Yes, sir. Good morning. Good, Good morning. Uh, I have actually worked with a whole lot of people in town at the judge's uh, behest and have talked with them and this is a kind of a consensus opinion about how we manage the flags around the courthouse. Some time ago we started with 80 flags around the courthouse. Uh, the most destructive item for flags is the weather and it doesn't take long for a very nice flag to look like a tattered old flag that needs to be retired. And that's where we are today. We're down to probably 10 or 15 American flags in the basement of the courthouse and maybe half a dozen Texas flags in the courthouse that are still probably in some condition of flying, but they're not. 
Currently, CASA is flying their flags and, and they own their flags. So the proposal was to focus on the front of the courthouse, which is the side that faces the opera house, where it tends to be the front, and it's where we have our monuments and the Travis letter, and to put the flags up for a nominal 10, 10 to 14 day period around the holiday. So seven or eight days before the holiday and two, three days after the holiday, we take it down. So nominally about 10 to 14 days. That way, the public coming into town can see, oh, there's something coming up. Oh, I wonder what that is. Oh, that's, that's Memorial Day. That's Fourth of July. That's uh, Texas Independence Day. So we've, we're going to propose that for four holidays. They're on the, on the docket here. I have a brother-in-law agreement with the Texas Heroes Foundation, which I'm on their board of directors with Errol Flannery. And we will borrow the 12 Texas flags from them and we'll place their Texas flags in front of the courthouse around the March 2nd date, Texas Independence date. So 10 days before and four, three, four, five days afterwards. All of the steel that we plan to use, which is the rebar, is already in place in the courthouse. So if it doesn't get stolen, we'll have steel to put the flags up and we'll place the steel uh, 12 spaces across the front of the courthouse, evenly spaced, and put the flags in the steel. So the intent would be we put the steel in, we put the flags up, we take the flags down, we take the steel back, and we place it back in the courthouse. Okay. Any, any questions? It, yeah. I'll tell you, Leland and Lawrence has instituted a good deal up here. Instead of having to drive those that steel into the ground each and every time and pull them up and change them on the deal, he has put down a pipe in there and has buried it below the center of the ground so it'll be very easy from now on to put the metal in and then put the plastic pipes up then. So that was a very good idea that you came up, save a lot of time and labor with your men. So it was a very good idea. So to make that a lot going. So okay. I think it's a very good idea and I like this schedule here that you've got. So do I hear a motion? I'll make the motion to um, approve the following schedule for the placement and removal of flags along the sidewalk surrounding the historic courthouse. February 20th each year, install Texas flags for Texas Independence Day, remove on March 6th. On, then on May 16th each year, install American flags for Memorial Day, remove on May 31st. On June 24th each year, install American flags for Independence Day, removed July 8th. And then on November 1st each year, install American flags for Veterans Day and remove on November 15th. Second. Okay, most been made by Commissioner Amielson to approve the schedule. I won't go by that, Kat. Uh, Ms. Lang, you've got the schedule on that, on that particular schedule. Second by Commissioner Wilson. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. You got your deal. Thank you very much. I think I'm on for 10 too. Okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, and number 10. That's right. <laughs> Discuss and take appropriate action to direct the county auditor to set up a non departmental budget line with $500 each year for the purpose of replacing damaged U.S. flags. Um, I know in past, when we, a few years ago, uh, in the facilities maintenance department, there was enough budget for Jay Riley to actually pay for the flags. But each year, his budget was cut until he finally could not afford to do that. So you're saying, Bill, but barring the flags from the Texas Hero Foundation, you've got the Texas flags covered. So what we need is just the American. U.S. flags yes. on the deal. And if we could get $500, that would keep enough flags flying pursuant to this schedule. Yes, and, and because the flags are only up about 10 days at a time instead of 360 days a year, I would expect the life of the flags to be much improved. Uh, and we also have t typically north, north winds coming across and the courthouse faces south, so it blocks a lot of the damage to the winds, to the flags. So I think I th my view is the $500 is kind of a max, uh, up to $500, but at least there's money there and we want to buy American-made, sewn cotton flags. 
that look look good in front of the courthouse. Yep. I agree with that American-made cotton flag. Yep. I do with that. We're going to get this money from Fund 55, Ms. Auditor. Is there any questions? Or We're, contingency. Okay. Either which. Either one. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we can do that. Okay, do I hear a motion? Um, I just have a question. So how will, will he just submit an invoice to you when he needs to replace a flag? Is no, that? Let me say this. I, I would like the city uh, purchasing department to buy them because they are skilled and they are they know how to maximize the leverage that the city has for buying flags. You mean the county? I, I'm thinking the city's buying other things besides just these flags. They're buying the flags for the poles in front, and there are probably parks that are being bought by the city and other places. So I'm sure they have a supplier of choice or supplier candidates of choice that they could buy from. Who's going to spearhead the effort? You Pardon? want us to pursue the flags with the city? I, uh, that would that'd be my suggestion, yes, that let, let the city, I mean, the, the courthouse is a little microcosm of itself, mm -hmm. but there are, uh, there are purchased flags that look like either state or city or county flags all around. So we've got them at the parks, we have them uh, in mm -hmm. front of public buildings, we have them at, at the courthouse, there's a big, big pole with an American flag and a Texas flag on it. So somebody's buying those. It's not a private individual. It's not an organization like us. As I was suggesting, we use that, that vehicle to make the purchasing and they leverage their, their buys based upon that. So are okay. you gonna get with the city and then let us know or? I, I think what you're saying is you just want us to get, come up with the flags. Yes. Right. Yeah, yes. yeah, I think, okay. I think county, okay. county purchasing is, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, yeah. So, so we you'll just, just request what you need and we'll take yes, care I, of Yes, I'm going to do an inventory of what's in the basement, what's usable and not, and what I'd like to start with is 12 brand new flags and put the other flags in reserve. I, I wouldn't even mind saying if we get down to five flags, I'll say, hey, we probably need to buy five more flags. But we have somewhere between 10 and 12 flags in the basement that the condition is unknown. Uh, we did take an inventory of them and they look okay, but I haven't looked at them from the, you know, having them really look nice and not flapping and broken on the ends and broken grommets and, and dirty and that kind of stuff. Well, I'm sure Mr. Tillman will give you his phone number and you can just <laughs> talk to him when we need It's, it's on the sign up sheet, so uh, there, okay. So what we want to do is just go ahead and have a budget of $500 and let Place. Mr. Harris, you and we'll work it out with the purchasing agent here to, to use right. that money to purchase the U.S. cotton flags. All right. So yes. is it ready for a motion? Yes. So I'll uh, make the motion to direct the county auditor to set up a non-departmental budget line with $500 each year for the purpose of replacing the damaged flags. Right. Second. And I'll be the first to say, if we don't need it, we don't need it. I, I'm happy to give it back. I think that's something we can work at. <clears throat> so nominally, the flag, those kind of flags run between 35 and $45 a piece, three by five. And there's at least half a dozen American makers in the United States that make good flags. Okay. Uh, well, thank you. All right, a motion been made by Commissioner Samuelson, direct the county auditor, set up a non-departmental budget line item with $500 each year for the purpose of replacing damaged U.S. flags. With the person department and Bill Harris, you're going to coordinate that, make sure they're up. You did a good job, and you are brother SRT. We appreciate that, okay? It, it, second by Commissioner Wilson. 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 Mm -hmm. Okay? Any further discussion? All those in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed, say nay. Motion carries unanimously. Okay. Item number 11 talks about a journey into executive session, and we're going to save that until last. We will get through with everything else so we don't have to keep you good folks here. So we're going to go now to the consent agenda, and I ask any commissioner if they wish to pull any item from the consent agenda or question any item. If not, do I hear a motion? Yes, I move that we approve the consent agenda as stated. Second. A yeah, motion been made by Commissioner Wilson that we approve the consent agenda as stated. Second by Commissioner Wilson. Eagle. I mean Eagle. 
Any further uh, commentary? If not, all those in favor say yay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Kind of mess okay, with motion us. carries unanimously. Kind okay. of mess with us. <laughs> no road items, Mr. Lenny, right? So development, Mr. Clint Head, set a public hearing for the replant of Laguna Tres Estates. What date? May 28th. May 20th? 28th. 28th. Okay. I hear a motion. Uh, yeah, Judge, I'll make a motion to set a public hearing for the replant of Laguna Trace Estates, lots one and two. Block 5R for May 28th. Second. It must be made by Commissioner Eagle to set a public hearing for the replant of Laguna Trace Estate, lots one and two for May 28th. Uh, second by Commissioner Wilson. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. Motion carries unanimously. Number two, discuss and consider abandoning and removing a portion of County Road 309 from the County Road System. Amelson. Well, this, oh, go yeah. ahead. Uh, the county has received a request to abandon, abandon a portion of County Road number 309 and remove it from the County Road System. This was done in Somerville County on December 11th, and now uh, the portion that is in Hood County is being requested to be abandoned and removed from the County Road System. And it's, it kind of runs at a slant, but one side's like, where's it at? One side, the north side would be 204 feet, and the south side would be 165.93 feet. This is at the end of the road? Yes. This was a request from the property owners at the end of the road. That's what they want. Okay. You want yeah. Anything um, else? Do no. I hear a motion? Uh, I'll make a motion to approve the abandoning and removing a portion of County Road 309 from the County Road System. Second. Second. Motion, motion been made by Commissioner Samuelson to abandon and remove a portion of the County Road 309 from the County Road System, second by Commissioner Wilson. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. Motion carries unanimously. Okay, now a public hearing to discuss and consider the replant of the ranches at Star Hollow, Lot 1R. So at this time, at uh, 1033, we're adjourning into a public hearing. Mr. Head. This replant is being done to combine lots one and two in block one, creating a 10 acre lot known as lot 1R. This property is in the road corridor district in precinct one and is served by on-site well and on-site sewage facilities. Staff has reviewed the replant and all comments have been addressed. Okay. So that's all right with you. The city says so. Staff recommends approval is presented. Okay. Okay. Any questions or comments? If not, Okay, at now at uh, 1034, we're convening back into commissioner's court. Do I hear a motion? Yeah, Judge, I'll move that we accept the replat of the ranches at Star Hollow, Lot 1, R, Block 1. Okay, motion been made by Commissioner Andrews that we accept the replat of the ranches at Star Hollow, Lot 1, R. Second. One. Second by Commissioner Samuelson. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. Motion carries Thank unanimously. You. Thank you, Mr. Head. Okay, financial. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Um, all right, let's see. So it's the end of the month. So we are, the auditor's office has reviewed all these monthly reports and accepts them. And the auditor's office has reviewed all the invoices for this court and recommends payment. Okay. Any questions or comments? If not, do I hear a motion? Yeah, I move we pay the bills for $435,322.30. Yeah, a motion been made by Commissioner Andrews to pay the bills in amount of $435,322.30. Second by? All second. By Commissioner Wilson. 
Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say nay. Motion carries unanimously. Okay. Last item, consider the financial reports. Hello. I looped them together. I apologize. Okay, so the auditor's office has reviewed all of the monthly reports and asked the court to accept them. Okay. Do I hear a motion? I make a motion that we um, approve the monthly reports as presented by the audit department. Second. Second. Motion been made by Commissioner Samuelson to approve the financial reports from all the departments. Second by Commissioner Eagle. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say nay. Motion carries unanimously. So at this time, at 1035, we are adjourning into executive session to review and discuss the resumes received for the vacated county clerk position pursuant to Texas Local Government Code 87.041. We will then re-adjourn into regular session and take appropriate action if necessary. Okay. So it, yes. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, and we're going to do this, and I, I apologize for not getting this on the agenda, uh, but this will be under Texas Government Code 551.074 is the reason for going into executive session. Okay, at four minutes, at, you, we're on, okay, at four minutes after 11, we are convening back into commissioner's court from executive session. No decisions were made, but we do have a motion that we're gonna make. You. Commissioner Eagle, you wanna? Sure, I'll make it. So I'm gonna make a motion to direct uh, Ms. Wellborn to close the posting for county clerk as of now. Uh, to set up interviews with uh, the, those we discussed and to set that up for Monday for a special commissioner's court meeting on Monday the 29th uh, of April at the historic courthouse at 9 a.m. A motion been made by Commissioner Eagle to first close all the nominations for county clerk at this time to set uh, the hearing for certain nominations at 9 a.m. this Monday morning at the historic courthouse. And uh, that's it, right? Do I hear a second? Second. And second by Commissioner Wilson. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say nay. Motion carries. Meeting is adjourned.